Good morning, everyone. Hi there. Kathy Brooks of the Hydrant Club here for our weekly canine linguistics session. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I know we missed last week. A uh, girl, girl, girl had to take a break, and I had some stuff going on, so apologies for not being here with you last week. And so for today, the topic that we're going to discuss, a lot of people got puppies during the pandemic. Um, a lot of people got young dogs during the pandemic. Um, and, and so I've been getting a lot of uh, calls and emails from folks regarding uh, puppy teething. And uh, it's an interesting topic. And so uh, what we're gonna talk about today is dogs' mouths and how they utilize them, what they utilize them for, um, mouthing versus teething, because they are not the same thing, and what are some simple things that we can do as responsible humans to appropriately correct our dogs for inappropriate behavior and redirect them. Um, obviously, when we've got a, a, a puppy, you know, people, so first of all, for people who have very young puppies, so we're talking, you know, eight, nine, 10 weeks old, um, these, you know, people talk about, you know, the puppies, uh, you know, chewing on them and they talk about the puppies teething. So they're not teething. At that age, their puppy teeth are all still very much in place. Their uh, adult teeth have not started coming in yet. And so, you know, when a baby is teething, they're teething because they're cutting teeth, literally like the teeth are cutting through their skin. And so they need to, you know, chew on things to give relief to the gums. Puppies are no different than that. So a puppy, an eight week old puppy or a nine week old puppy that starts chewing on your hands isn't teething on you. It's mouthing on you. And what does that mean? Um, and, uh, and greetings to the folks who are chiming in. Christopher, always good to see, always good to see your name. And uh, my friend Christopher, uh, also known as VGK Warmies guy, he's a, a super fan of the Vegas Golden Knights. Go Knights, go! Okay, so, and you'll notice I am wearing a VGK hat. It's my Bark Andre furry hat. Okay, so when a puppy starts putting its mouth on a human, um, you know, so keep in mind, you know, puppy is born, puppy can't see, puppy can't hear, puppy can only smell, and its only interaction at that point is with its mother, um, obviously suckling on the mother um, to feed. Um, the puppy, as it is interacting with its mother, will mouth on the mother, and the mother will respond to it in kind. This is, uh, you know, they don't have opposable thumbs, dogs and so they are holding on they're you know getting that intimate connection um, through through the mouthing gesture there's a point though where the puppies would be mouthing on the adult and it would no longer be appropriate and they would be corrected for it um, there is a very common misconception about how to address it when a dog bites down on you um, whether it is in play or otherwise. And that common misconception is to yelp or to utter a squeal. This is just about the worst possible thing you can do because what you've just done in that moment is not set up a uh, superior to subordinate relationship or authority to follow a relationship. You have just set up a peer-based or even a subordinate-based relationship because when two dogs are interacting with each other and chewing on each other uh, and one dog kind of yelps or whimpers a little almost like the dog version of saying uncle okay you got me let me go what they're doing is they are ceding their authority they are giving in to the other dog so when i yelp or make a noise of, of discomfort at a dog at a puppy chewing on me i have established the foundation that that dog is superior to me, which is incredibly confusing, especially if we're talking about a young puppy. Let's be really, really clear. Dogs are not people. They are not furry people. They're not little furry people. They are not our fur babies. We can use whatever words we want. And yes, we love them and they're beloved members of our family, but they are dogs. They are not people. They do not think like people. They do not experience the world like people. Um, doesn't mean that they don't have the same feelings that we have. Doesn't have, mean they don't have uh, emotions about things. But much like a pre-verbal child, 
they don't know what those feelings or emotions necessarily mean. They just have the emotion or the feeling. It's very, very primal, very, very uh, kind of a, a primitive emotional state. So when a puppy is mouthing on me, an appropriate response would be to very gently take the puppy's mouth. So if this, let's say this is a puppy, actually, hey, Harlow, can one of my kids come over here? Come here, Harlow. Okay, I'm gonna show you. So let's say Harlow's mouth were on me. I would very gently take my other hand, open her mouth, remove my hand, sorry, baby, remove my hand from her mouth and just very, very gently hold her mouth and just say no. That's it. Very, very simple. When we're talking about a tiny little puppy, the, uh, oh, and people are saying hi, Harlow, so Harlow's gonna wave. Um, when we're talking about a very small puppy, when we're talking about uh, a, a young dog that's just learning, the gestures that we use need to be firm, but they're very, very gentle. It's the uh, uh, velvet glove over the strong hand. It is a very firm, but very gentle gesture. I don't grab the dog. I don't give the dog a sharp correction for a gentle redirection of something that the dog doesn't understand what it's doing wrong. It's a puppy being a puppy and putting its mouth on another living being to see, are you a peer of mine or are you a superior to me? Because if you're a superior to me and I put my mouth on you in a way that isn't appropriate or appropriate, as the case may be, that older dog, that superior dog will growl, will show its teeth, will maybe grab the dog with its teeth very gently and give it a little nip or a bite. And so by very gently but firmly taking the dog's mouth and opening it, removing my hand, and then just saying no, and then that's it. Then I can say you're a good dog and I can put the dog down. So, you know, I'm never doing anything at this point to, you know, I never strike a dog, you know, just to be very, very clear. One never does that. It's never appropriate to raise your hand, especially in that sort of corrective measure to a dog, because they don't, they don't understand. That's applying a human psychology, a human gesture. And, and to be clear, I'm not suggesting that hitting people as a matter of correction is a good idea. So specifically with dogs, we don't want to um, use a human psychology or human gesture to, to ch tell the dog no. So removing my hand from their mouth or my arm or whatever the body part may be, a very gentle grasp. You can't see because you don't, you know, it's, it's very gentle. Think of it like a gentle but firm handshake. It's not a bone crusher. I'm not trying to make a point by hurting somebody. It's just a very firm and solid gesture. So then what do I want to do? I then want to redirect the puppy to something that is appropriate for it to put its mouth on. Now this could be a toy. Um, it could be a favorite stuffy that the dog has or a Kong toy is always great. I am a big fan of utilizing a, an animal based product to redirect the puppy and to give the puppy something that is appropriate to chew on. And I have some examples. Now the thing to keep in mind when we're talking about a puppy, a really little puppy, we're talking about puppy teeth. Those puppy teeth are going to fall out and the adult teeth are going to grow in. You don't want to give a young, young puppy anything that's too terribly hard. I'm a big fan for a puppy of things like this. So this is a cow tendon. Um, it's a pretty short length of tendon uh, that's been dried. And it's got a nice, it's got a, you can see that there's a little bit of give to it. It's a little bit soft as the puppy chews on it and kind of gets that up in there and chews on it. It will soften. Um, it is completely organic. You know, if the puppy, you know, bites off a little piece and chews it up and swallows it, the puppy can digest it. It is completely organic. We get our um, cow based or pig based or goat based or any animal based products uh, only from USDA certified organic. Um, healthy, they're all you know, free range, eating good feed, no antibiotic, no antibiotics, no hormones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything that went into those animals is healthy. They were uh, raised in a healthy way. The the slaughter was done in a humane sort of way, um, and so the animals lived, you know, happy lives till they went to their their purpose. And um, it's so funny, all of my dogs are sitting down here right now. You'll get some later. So a cow tendon is a great solution for a puppy or a smaller dog. Now we have, you've probably heard of bully sticks. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a bully stick is, um, if you've heard the phrase hung like a bull, 
that tells you what part of the bull anatomy a bully stick is. So there's bully pizzle or bully stick. So the pizzle is going to be more of a, just a, a, a narrow kind of a slender piece. You can get them thicker. Um, you can actually get them braided. So this is multiple pieces of that bully stick that have been braided. You can get them roasted. You can get them freeze dried. You can get them in different lengths. They can be odor free or natural. There's all sorts of permutations. Um, and it's a good, healthy, organic, again, treat that you can give the dog. This isn't something you just lay around and let the dog get it whenever they want. Using it as redirection, using it as a reward, um, using it after a at the end of a training session when the dog has done a really great job, those are great options. So in addition to Bully Pizzle, there's also various, um, as well as tendon, there's also various muscles. So this is actually um, Beef Weezand, which is a kind of a back strap muscle that comes off of the rear end of the cow, kind of right above its uh, hind leg, above its thigh. In this case, this one was actually done as a pretzel, which is super cute. Um, they often just come in a long strip, which you can cut into various pieces. And that's a good, um, again, it's tough enough to give them something to really get their teeth into, but it's not so tough that they're going to do damage to their teeth. So we also have I have a trachea in here. I don't have a long trachea, but I have a piece of trachea here. Cow trachea, um, you know, bovine uh, or uh, porcine pig or lamb trachea is a great solution for dogs. Um, it, it's a great source of glucosamine and chondroitin, which is great for dogs' hips. Uh, it's also got a lot more toughness to it. It's something that will take the dog a lot longer to consume. Uh, I'm going to withhold talking about power chewers. You know, some of the bully breed dogs and the larger breed dogs, we'll talk about them at the end. But, you know, your average chewing dog, it's going to take them a little while. Trachea can be found in all kinds of different lengths. This is obviously just a small ring that has a piece of uh, beef lung, roasted beef lung kind of wedged into the middle. And then uh, you can get it in three inch, five inch, seven inch, as well as full length trachea. So depending on the size of your dog, Again, this isn't something you're just going to leave down for your dog and leave down, you know, forever. It's something that you want to give the dog as a reward after a meal, et cetera, et cetera. Ooh, what else do I have in my goodie basket here? All right. So you see people talking about antlers. So antlers, um, you, what you want to do, first of all, if you're going to use antlers as an alternative to something for to redirect your dog to, I'm a big fan of the split antler because what the dog's really trying to get at is that marrow in the middle there, which if it is a whole antler, the only place it's going to get to it is there at the end. Um, antlers are hard. They're really, really hard. Much like a dog bone, you want to be careful with the age of the dog. A much older dog, not a great candidate for antlers, a very young dog that's just developing its teeth, probably not a great a great solution either. Um, so you want this to be a late adolescent to adult dog. The power chewers and antlers, a great solution, but you also wanna be really careful. Uh, antlers can crack and splinter. Um, you've got deer, you've got elk, you've got moose, you've got all sorts of different, uh, obviously animals that have antlers. There's also different kinds of horns you can get from different kinds of water buffalo and the like. Um, you want to make sure again that the sourcing for these is um, is healthy. When we're talking about antlers, a lot of the time you want to go with a vendor that's actually taking naturally shed antlers as opposed to necessarily killing the animal to get them because that can lead to um, kind of evisceration of, of entire populations. All right. Now, if you've got a uh, what did we talk about that one? We talked about that one. Okay. So now we start getting into dog bones. Um, so in this case, what we have here is a piece of a femur that's been sliced up. So there's six different pieces in here. There's marrow in the middle of that. This is for a small dog. That dog can get to that marrow really well, can kind of eat all the gunk off the outside. What's nice about these is that you can boil them in some hot water once the dog has finished with everything. You could put some peanut butter in the middle and shove it in the freezer, and you can get a couple more uses out of it. The thing to keep in mind, whether it's little bones like this or a big ass bone like this one, obviously for your big power chewers, 
you really just don't want to leave it down for the dog to the dog for the dog to get to it at any point in time. Um, you really want to use it again as a reward, as a treat, as a redirection, um, especially for the younger dogs. But again, with the younger dogs, you want to redirect them to something that's not going to damage their teeth. I walk into a lot of clients' homes and I'll see the, the full-size version of one of these, not section. And you see these just deep grooves in it where the dog's just been kind of worrying at it and worrying at it. That's ultimately not great for the dog's teeth. There's no real nutritional value for the dog at that point in time. And it can actually create additional anxiety by giving the dog something that it's like it's really chewing on. So the really important thing to think about here though is, is that when a dog puts its mouth on another dog, for example. So if I'm a young dog being corrected by an adult dog and that adult dog bites down on me, my response as a dog is to relinquish authority to that older dog, to that superior dog. My body's gonna relax. I might utter uh, that vocalization, that whimper or the yelp, you know, kind of the acquiescing to the superior dog and I stop moving. And what'll happen with a well-balanced adult or well-balanced superior dog in that moment is they may give just a little shake and then they'll release and they'll leave them be. Now, if the dog being corrected fights in any way, you know, or struggles in any way, you could actually get a fairly, fairly serious altercation that ensues. So let me explain to you why I just shared that information. So what happens when a dog bites down on a human? on your average human, someone who's not a trained professional who's gotten bitten in the course of work or things like that, but in your average person, when a dog bites down, what's the first thing we do? They yell, and then they start to thrash or pull away. And what happens in that moment is the dog's instinct kicks in, the dog bites down harder, may even start shaking um, and prey drive can be catalyzed in that moment. The number of times I hear stories about small children who have been gravely injured or worse, killed by a family dog that's never bitten anyone before. Um, you know, so A, you've got adults who have left a child alone with a dog, which is just a bad choice. And second of all, what's probably happened because a lot of those bites are around the neck or the shoulder or the face, what's probably happened in most of those situations, and probably the vast majority of them, is that the child was doing something that was irritating to the dog, or bothersome, or that it shouldn't have been done doing. And that dog, either the dog was being irritated or bothered, or the dog has a, an inappropriate sense of its authority over those people, or over that child, and it bites down to do what it believes is an appropriate correction. Child screams, dog becomes a dog. Under no circumstances, it doesn't matter how big or how small your dog is. And sometimes we see this as a bigger problem with the smaller dogs because people say, oh, it's a small dog. You know, the dog's not gonna do any damage. But a small dog's teeth, make no mistake, they're painful and they can do damage. And what's worse than that is if that dog bites a person and that bite is bad enough, that dog is gonna be the one who gets punished. So. Don't encourage your dog to chew on you, um, especially if you are someone who has kids. I don't care how old your kids are. I don't care if they're teenagers. I don't care if they're little. You know, the children shouldn't be left alone with the dog and they shouldn't be encouraged to play with the puppy or the dog as if they are litter mates. We are not litter mates to our dogs. We are not peers to our dogs any more than our parents are our friends. Now. Are we friendly with our parents when we become older and we become adult? Sure, but our parents are still our parents. They are still authority figures, or at least they should be. And so we must retain that solid relationship with our dogs. Otherwise, dog gonna be a dog, and then the dog's gonna be the one who gets punished. So that's it for today. Thanks for tuning in. I hope that's been helpful. If you have any questions or there's a topic that you would like us to address here on Canine Linguistics, don't hesitate to let us know. Until then, happy tales.